Good afternoon, everyone. I'll be uh, talking to you all about environmental justice and the nexus of environmental justice with development. Uh, let me start my talk by sharing with you some important statistics about why environment is important for the development of the country. It's often the case that environment is taken as a villain and uh, the propaganda is if you want to develop then you should not be talking about environmental protection. That is totally wrong. More so in the context of Bangladesh which is a country that has very close relationship with nature and natural resources and it's in fact the nature and natural resources uh, that are the sources of livelihood for a vast number of Bangladeshi people. Bangladesh is known as a riverine country, no? We say Nodi Matrik because the country is a creation of rivers, is the largest riverine delta of the world and 60% of our people, 60% have their only animal protein intake from the river fishes. The largest mangrove forest of the world is situated where? Is the Shundabans. So we shared the biggest mangrove forest of the world with India. And huge number of people depend on the forest for their livelihood. And this particular forest is protecting us, has protected us from the onslaught of a number of natural disasters. We all know about Isla, Cedar, Yash. It is because of the Shundabans that loss of lives of people have been very less in Bangladesh. Imagine there was no Shundarban. What would have happened to all of us with Cedar, Isla and Yash? We have the longest unbroken sea beach of the world. And we have about 21 coastal districts, which is one third of the country. We uh, are essentially an agrarian economy country. The GDP contribution from agriculture is 12.6% and agriculture till today employs 37.75% of our people. So there is no way that the country would develop and will not be protecting its environment. If you really have to have sustainable development in the country, you have to put environment at the center and then prepare your development plans. If it's the other way around, that you put development at the center, the so-called development which are often unvetted by us. So if you put development at the center and then want the development to be guiding nature and natural resources, that is not going to happen because nature has its own rule. Nature really doesn't follow your rule or someone else's rule. Now, despite such heavy uh, dependence on environment and natural resources, the environmental management scenario, governance scenario here in Bangladesh is rather gloomy. The deforestation rate in the world is 1.3% annually. In Bangladesh, the deforestation rate is 2.6%. In any country having a good environmental management, it should have 25% of its landmass as forest. We have much less than 25%. The forest department would tell you that we have 11% forest cover. I seriously doubt the statistics that's given by the forest department. Even if it's 11%, we are 14% short of what is required. With that shortage, we are destroying our forest at a rate of 2.6%, which is double the global rate. We have issues with our rivers, although we are a creation of rivers, most of our rivers are actually shared rivers that we share with India, uh, China and Nepal. And we have huge problem with the transboundary river management. We have never in the history of Bangladesh got the due share uh, that the people are entitled to. At the national level, you know about the rampant encroachment over our river bodies. Those are uh, narrowing down the river body and impacting the flow of the river. We have about 63,000 
encroachments over our river bodies. That is an official statistics, but those of us who live in Bangladesh would know that the actual number of encroachment will actually be much higher. We are indiscriminately polluting our rivers in the name of development. We believe that we need tanneries and we believe that tanneries are more important than the Dholeshwari river. We believed that tanneries are more important than the Budiganga river and that is why we allowed the 83 tanneries or 87 tanneries to continue polluting the Budiganga till it was declared biologically dead. Biologically dead means it can neither sustain life nor give birth to life. So then we thought that we will have to protect Budiganga and we relocated the tanneries to Dhaleshwari and the Dhaleshwari is now also getting biologically dead. Now to answer me one question, how many tanneries do you think the state can create? 100 tanneries? 200 tanneries? Possible. How many rivers do you think the state can create? Then why destroying the rivers when you can't create them? And it's not, it is no gain saying um, in holding that tannery is bringing us a huge foreign revenue. That's not really the case. An economic analysis of the tanneries as they stand today would tell you that they are neither fe financially feasible nor environmentally tolerable. Uh, 29 of our rivers have been listed as extremely polluted by the Department of Environment. Our air is the worst air in the world. Just two days back, there was a report that the Bangladeshis are inhaling the worst air of the world. We live in a city which is one of the most unlivable cities of the world. No? Last year, a very alarming fact has been revealed by the government agency that's doing research on the soil quality. According to that agency, 90% of our soil is contaminated by heavy metals or chemicals. This has happened because we have ignored our own species and we have opted for hybrid species to grow more food for the people. And in the race of growing more food, we are actually producing unsafe food for our generation and for our next generation. Added to all these national level crises that we are faced with, we also have the issue of climate change and it is being said that Bangladesh is one of the most vulnerable countries due to climate change and if climate change happens the way it's being feared the way it's being predicted then one third of Bangladesh which means the entire coastal Bangladesh will go underwater which means we will lose 21 per 21 of our coastal districts and we and you definitely and your next generation will have to draw the map of Bangladesh differently which means we are compromising to some extent with our sovereignty. And if that happens, then all the sweetwater fishery that we have, we now stand second in terms of sweetwater fishery in the world. So the, the, the water of the sweetwater fisheries will all get salinated because the sea will go up, the sea will rise and enter the riverine uh, landscape. Just a very recent um, study report, 10% of our population, 10% of our population hold 44% of our national income. That tells you how inequitable the development is in Bangladesh. Now the journey for environmental justice has actually been very exciting, very challenging. The roads have been bumpy, but we have managed to set precedents. Although those precedents are being frustrated by number one, non-compliance with the judicial orders, number two, promulgation of policies, rules that are not in compliance with the judicial orders, and number three, politicization and shrinking space for democratic voices. We are following a path of uh, uh, development that is uh, extremely carbon intensive, which is not at all climate friendly and also arbitrary. We, the people of Bangladesh, do not have the space to say that we don't want coal-based power plant, we want renewables. It is the policy makers who decide and who impose things on us. They don't really get into constructive debates and discussion with us about the path of development. Uh, there are some procedural aspects of right to development. For example, no population will be disproportionately impacted by a 
given development. But that's always happening. You have seen how people have been killed in Bashkali because they were opposing one coal-based power plant. You are seeing how many workers are dying every year in the shipbreaking yards of Bangladesh. And it is happening because the Western world are behaving, uh, have adopted a double standard and they are protecting they, their labor forces and their beaches and sending all the vessels on the, on the beaches of Bangladesh on the plea that we need iron. Now, how many countries of the world don't need iron? We all need iron, but how many are engaged in shipbreaking? Only three. Why is that so? That's because these are the countries that have weak regulatory framework and weak standards for labor protection. So the procedural aspects about people's right to participate, the government uh, objectively analyzing the environmental impact assessment of given projects, making the environmental impact assessment projects public so that we can give our opinion, are processes that are being totally uh, ignored by the government or they make the paperwork so nicely that you can't even object, but you know that in reality they are not following what is written there in the project. Take the example of uh, Rampal coal-based power plant. If the EIA was done objectively, the coal power plant would not have been constructed just within 14 kilometers of the world's largest mangrove forest. Uh, our constitution in Article 18a um, has talked about protection of environment as a duty of the state and the state will be doing it for the generation, for the present generation and the future generation. And the state will be protecting environment, not only protecting, improving and protecting environment, wetlands, forest, biodiversity and wildlife. The statistics that I have just shared with you are all from reputed international agencies and they would tell you that how honest as a state we have been to this constitutional commitment. Uh, our higher judiciary has kept the hope for environmental justice alive. The courts have declared reavers uh, as legal persons and have declared the state as the trustee of as, as, as the trustee that is uh, and that is entrusted with the responsibility of protecting the rivers. The courts have barred conversion of forest land for non-forest purposes but you have just seen that there is a seven, 700 acre reserve, uh, protected forest land which is also an ecologically critical area and a national park in Cox Bazar but the government employees are trying to uh, get that 700 acres of forest for constructing a training center thereon. We have uh, gone to the court against indiscriminate use of pesticide. We have gone to the court against use of single-use plastic and for phasing out plastics. We have gone to the court uh, to regulate urbanization and to address the issue of culture of impunity and in a good number of cases we have seen that the higher judiciary has given very positive directions because the higher judiciary has translated the legal promises into action that is why we see that the BGMEA Bhavan has been demolished. It's a very slow process because the opponents are always very powerful it's not only the corporate houses who are creating the challenges for you. Unfortunately, for he, for, unfortunately, here in Bangladesh, the identity of the corporate entities and the regulators often get merged. We do not often understand whether the government is catering the needs of the common people or catering to the needs of the multinational corporations and the uh, land grabbers and the polluters. It seems that the, that the development vision of the government comes with uh, a prescription for pollution, as if pollution-free development is not possible, but that's actually very wrong. All these environmental uh, verdicts that we have got have actually been very empowering for people. In other cases, people would be very shy to go to the court. On environmental matters, people who come to us would always say, can my case be filed this Sunday? So there is a rush because of the fact that the higher judiciary has actually dealt with the environmental cases very positively. On the other hand, if you see the special environmental court that we have in Bangladesh that is one of the slowest in the world. Bangladesh was one of the first countries in South Asia to have an environmental court. Uh, India more or less at the same time set up the environmental green tribunal and their green tribunal is cited as an example in delivering environmental justice. On the other hand our environmental courts which is at the lower tier of the judiciary is the slowest in the world. There are as I said 
uh, disempowering strategies taken both by the government and the corporations. The government passes law like Foreign Donation Regulation Act through which it wants to control the voices of the uh, civil society. On the um, other hand, the government has the uh, Digital Security Act through which it's actually trying to curtail freedom of speech of common people, including the media. So that has uh, meant less space for us to uh, protest the uh, arbitrary development prescription that's being imposed on us. Uh, that is why it's no, no doubt that in environmental performance, the rank of Bangladesh is 162 out of 183. In, uh, in the index of rule of law, we are 124 out of 139 states. And in the index of justice, we are 115 out of 126. There is serious issue of accountability. There is serious issue of lack of transparency in the environmental governance in Bangladesh and all that is resulting to environmental injustices. The, uh, and the way environment is being polluted, environment is being contaminated, uh, perhaps accounts to ecocide. You're all familiar with the idea of genocide, but it's, it's accounting to ecocide. 44,000 acres of sal forest has now come down to 3,000 acres. This means that wildlife is disappearing and we have just seen how uh, elephants are being killed and as if there is nobody responsible in this country to ensure that elephants have the right to uh, leave. So when, when, when 44,000 acres of sal forest come down to 3,000, it's not only the forest that we are losing or the wildlife that we are losing, the forest dependent people are also losing their land, also losing their cultivable land, also losing their homestead, also losing their source of medicine. And all the crimes against the environment that are being committed in Bangladesh are being committed with knowledge, knowledge about their adverse impact on environment, but they are being committed be because the interests of few are given priority over the interests of the common people. They are being committed with the knowledge that they'll have long term uh, and perhaps widespread impact on the lives and livelihood of the common people of Bangladesh. And the only way to counter the repressive strategies coming from both the government and the corporations would be to resist, to mobilize people and to ask for a transformation. Thank you very much. Thank you.